What's up, everybody? I'm Scott Casper, along with Tony Hager, the man to my left. Thanks for joining us for this week's edition of Global Wrestling News. Well, the United States has a new world champion. Ohio State legend Logan Stieber won four bouts in Budapest, including a come-from-behind victory over Russia and another from Iran. In the final, Stieber hit three takedowns in a turn, beating out Georgia's Becca Latabzi 8-4. I think we both said Logan would medal, so we're one for one, Tony. But did we think he was going to be a world champ? Yeah, we picked up right where we did at the World Cup, winning matches in the crunch time. His road wasn't easy. Right. Every single one of the wrestlers that he had t ranked in the top 12. And mind you, when he came into this tournament, unranked. So that's a huge feat. Huge first uh, world championship for uh, Logan Steamer. I mean, we're usually the ones getting scored on at the last second, so it was nice for us to be on the other side for once. Yeah, Steamer has that young, aggressive, open style from his feet. Perfect. This was just a perfect way for him. We need more weights at the Olympic level. You know, just think about how many events swimmers get. They get to compete in all these different, you know, distances, and, and we are fighting for one weight class, one event, and I just feel like it's – Really unfair for wrestling, but I guess we have to just keep our sport in the Olympics and then start complaining about more weights later. So many swimming events, I get seasick watching the Olympics. All right, let's talk about James Green. He won his first match pretty easy, tech fall over Azerbaijan, but his offense completely fell off after that. Yeah, 4-1 victory over Georgia in the second round, but lost in the third on criteria and, and was eliminated. Somewhat similar to what happened to Burroughs at the Olympics. Have foreigners figured out how to keep these guys from scoring? You know, it's hard to score multiple points at this level on anybody. I mean, Green, there's more film on Green, so you know people are able to study him. When he came out, he really just burst on the scene, right. kind of like Jaden Cox and Kyle Snyder did, so they, they're able to study him a little bit more. And, and the guy he was going up against was a, a world bronze medalist, so it's not like he didn't falter to you know a top-level athlete. I know. He said in his interview that guys don't want to wrestle with him, and he felt like he was getting stalled out the entire tournament. Do you agree? And, you know, that's kind of the point, though. I mean, if, if you're wanting to win the match, you got to do whatever it takes to get it done. And what they did exactly what they needed to do. Slow James Green down. Slow the match down so Green can't have those open attacks from about anywhere. He's able to do that. Russell was able to, uh, you know, really slow the match down and got the job done. All right, next chapter, let's turn it. Women's freestyle veteran Allie Reagan struck silver on the final day. She opened up with an 8-4 victory over India's Sarita and then took out Canadian Linda Murray 6-3. We go to the quarters. She picked up a five-point shutout over Germany's Laura Mertens and then rolled into the gold medal round with a, get this now, Tony, a 14-4 tech over Kazakhstan. She was unable to connect on anything in the finals and was shut out by 18-year-old sensation Jingru Pai of China. Now, nothing negative to say about this, Tony. I know Ali was disappointed, but she was tremendous. She has to be happy with her performance. She grinded through the toughest side of the bracket, in my opinion. Uh, we, we said earlier, you know, previewing this event that she's going to have to find that offense, right. and she did that. She averaged around six points a match. So, you know, when earlier we were thinking, you know, two, three match were winning a when in bouts, she bumped it up to six, eight points sometimes. So good job out of her. All right, in her senior world debut, Sarah Hildebrand drew junior world champ Mayu Makaida of Japan in the opening round and dropped a 13-2 tech fall. Makaida would go on to reach the finals, and Hildebrand was then pulled back into Repizaj to face Ramona Galambas of Hungary. Hildebrand hit a four-point takedown in the first, but gave up seven unanswered in the second and dropped about 7-4. Yeah, I guess if you could take anything away from this, she got two points on Makaida, which was the only points that she surrendered the whole tournament. So... Takeaways from this this event for her, I think that she just needs it's more international experience, doing really well on the United States level here on our soil. But uh, you know that draw was tough going up against the junior world you know champ. So more and more international experience, I think she's going to be our, our gal at this weight class going forward. All right, let's talk Greco. It was another unsatisfactory performance on the Greco side. Patrick Martinez gave up an early takedown and three turns on a high gut wrench and fell 8-0 to Ashkan of Kazakhstan. Meanwhile. Christopher Gonzalez started strong with an 8-0 tech fall over Philip Dubsky and dropped a 2-2 criteria decision in the quarters and was thus eliminated as well. So let's recap. 4-3 record in women's freestyle, 6-1 in men's, 1-2 in Greco. This has got to be an all-too-familiar trend. I mean, if we're just looking at, you know, Greco here, it just... It simply lies on us not having enough experience. Our our lower level Greco experience is horrible. We have to get those kids starting early. 
They're starting to get into freestyle. Let's push them into, into free, you know, Greco and folk style. We can do all styles. There's plenty of time, 12 months out of the year, to get this done. All right, I'm not going to play the blame game here. I'm not going to blame Matt Lind. I don't think it's a coaching problem. I think it's a combination of assets being allocated to the sport so we can continue to develop the Greco uh, situation. What are your thoughts? I don't think you can blame Lindland. I mean, we, we need a, a development coach right there at the bottom That's going right. after those fifth – sixth, seventh, eighth graders, not the college kids, because those college kids have already given up on Greco. They're, they want to be freestyle stars now. So right. we got to go over those young guys, find somebody that likes you know, high-flying, big points like uh, you know Jesse Thilke that like to go high-flying. So find the Jesse Thilkes out there. you got to find them early. Can't wait till college. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. All right, hey, stay tuned. we got another superstar on the show today. Find out who when we come back. You're watching GWN, presented by Barbarian Apparel. Stay tuned. Wow, 40 years. Time really flies. Don't seem like it's been that long. It seemed like only yesterday that I started out route delivering it to the stores. For over 40 years, we're really proud to keep the same quality ingredients and not change our recipe. Help us celebrate our 40th anniversary by joining into our cookies recipe contest with a chance to win a Traeger Bronson 20 smoker. You can enter it on our Facebook page or cookiesbbq.com. Thanks for 40 years, and we'll see you in another 40 years. All right, from low wages to outdated contracts and everything in between, hundreds of former and current fighters are speaking out against the UFC. A longtime critic of the world's top mixed martial arts company, Hall of Fame heavyweight Randy Couture appeared on Capitol Hill to support expansion of the Muhammad Ali Act. With more on that, we welcome the man himself, former Oklahoma State Cowboy and UFC heavyweight champ, Randy Couture. Randy, welcome home. Thanks. Good to be, uh, good to be home. Let's talk about Mr. Smith going to Washington. First of all, can be formidable. <laughs> Perhaps it seems that UFC did not want this to happen. Uh, well, I, the, the UFC lobbyists were there in the room for the actual congressional hearing. Uh, the UFC has been lobbying against the fighters. Uh, basically, were, I, I was there representing MMAFA, the Fighters Association. Uh, we, we are pushing to try and get the Muhammad Ali Act, which which is federal legislation that was implemented in 2000 to protect boxers from from promoters uh, and some of the things that promoters in the boxing world were doing. Uh, we're, we're trying to get that act amended to include us as mixed martial artists. We have many of the same issues. I actually fill out the exact same paperwork a boxer does to get my license as a mixed martial artist or a second for that matter. We're governed and, and, and uh, controlled by the athletic commissions, just as boxers are, uh, we have many of the similar issues in the way our sport is promoted. Uh, but it was a very interesting experience. I don't think I've been that keyed up about an event since the first time I walked out the tunnel to, to go fight. Uh, 
it, it was a pretty intense uh, thing to, to be sitting there. And I'm glad I was sitting because then they couldn't see my leg shaking uh, as I was speaking to Congress. Uh, but it was good. I got to ask you, Randy, and, and I'll paraphrase something. I, I read an MMA junkie. What if Wimbledon in tennis, what if Wimbledon forced all of its top tennis players to sign an exclusive contract to, pe- to compete in Wimbledon for that title? Um, it seems to me to be a bit restrictive, restrictive in trade and restrictive in income. It is. It's anti-competitive, uh, the structure that's being used in mixed martial arts right now. And I use that exact uh, example uh, when I was speaking to, to the congressman of the subcommittee, uh, yes, the other uh, high-profile uh, tennis organizations like the U.S. Open, uh, the French Open, the Australian Open would all wither and die if Wimbledon was allowed to sign those athletes to uh, exclusive contracts. None of them would have access to the top athletes in their sport. And, uh, and again, I think this is a perfect example of, of the issue that we have in MMA right now. The UFC has got to be so big, Randy, that uh, it's almost worked against itself uh, for its, its, its seemingly uh, being restrictive with their fighters, not allowing them to make a decent living when there is no fight to prepare for and then there is no insurance, for example, if one half of a fight card pulls off and you've just gone through an eight-week uh, training period. Th- there's no paid for time spent. In, in some ways... Uh the anti-competitive nature of uh, what's going on in the sport and, and some of the things that the UFC is the biggest promotion in the sport is doing is allowing some of the other organizations to get some traction. Many fighters are fleeing, dealing with uh, Dana White and the UFC and going to Bellator, going to the World Series of Fighting. Uh, they don't want to wear a uniform. Uh, they, they don't want to do some of the things that that are very restrictive and, and kind of coerced in the contracts that the UFC is, is putting out there. So in some ways, it, even though across the board, the entire sport, they're all using the same system. They're all creating their own rankings and their own titles to, to their benefit. Uh, and they're manipulating those as they see fit. Uh, the UFC is, is in some ways shooting themselves in the foot. Our guest of the Nike Hot Seat today, famed fighter, movie star, and voice of the real fighters that are out there, those that are working hard in every gym around the country, Randy Couture. Randy, it's always good to uh, talk to you, and I want to thank our good friends at Extreme Couture, the gym in Las Vegas, for helping to make this possible. Thanks, bud. I appreciate it. All right, Tony, you got to look at the UFC roster. Most of these guys are former wrestlers who left the sport to pursue a better life in MMA. Yeah, 100%. He, you know, we even saw Kyle Snyder tweeting about wanting to get from, you know, from wrestling, going into MMA. He wants that money. It's a huge difference going into MMA. You see the big pay-per-view numbers that some of these guys are putting up. So, you know, these lower-tier guys, though, the guys that aren't the superstars, very hard to make a living in MMA. So this is uh, something for the future for those lower guys. All right, good point. You remember, of course, Sean Bunch told me he was sleeping in his car at one point. It's not uncommon for guys to stay in the back room of a gym either. This doesn't sound like the life of a professional athlete. It really, it sounds like a, a wrestler, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many wrestlers do you know have actually made a living? There's probably one to five maybe right now so you know these mma guys you know i I get that they want to make money but all all of them can't make money they can't be all big stars there's going to be lower tier guys so got to figure out if this is going to be your profession or your love for the sport and go your your, go your separate ways if you have to been with the ufc since the very beginning when they were losing three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a fight now they're making millions and millions of dollars literally billions of dollars and it's time to share with the athletes and the collective bargaining grouping these athletes together to have a bigger voice i think it's time and i think it's time congress act to add an addendum to the bill that's already in place all right back to wrestling we've got your top five weekend matchups to watch when we return you're watching gwn presented by defense soap In this town, there's only one pizza joint that has your best interests in mind. They make every single pie from scratch. The freshest ingredients, 100% real mozzarella. Oh, and if your engine's running a quart low, well, they can take care of that too. Casey's, 
famous for pizza. Right now, get free breadsticks with the purchase of any large made-from-scratch pizza. Yellow Blue wants to show you global energy demands are expanding at an alarming rate. Power grids in the U.S. are aging while coal plants continue to close at record rates. Utility rates are at an all-time high and there's no end in sight. If this concerns you, call Yellow Blue, delivering products and services that are not only green, but cost effective. You can be independent, safe, and secure. We'll show you how at yellowbluetech.com. All right, welcome back. Just because it's the holiday season doesn't mean that wrestlers take a break. No, indeed. Here's your top five matches to watch this week. Two guys you probably haven't heard of at 285. Write it down. Denzel DeJournay of App State and Jake McKiernan of SIU Edwardsville. You know, both these guys have, you know, not, they have some big wins, but not big name wins. The top five, you know, McKiernan shut out top five wrestler Brooks Black out of Illinois last weekend. I mean, he didn't, just slip by Brooks. He shut him out. So yeah. this is a big win. So kind of a welcoming party for him. A lot of people now know his name. So this weekend has an opportunity to pick up another big win. All right. Let's go to Bo Jordan, Ohio State versus Johnny Sebastian of Northwestern. Sets up an intriguing matchup here because I thought Sebastian was hurt, but I'm now told that he's ready to go. Yeah, he medically forfeited out of the Keystone Classic and suffered a loss at Penn State. So a lot of people are kind of questioning, you know, what's his status is, but you're telling me he's ready to go, so if he's ready, this is an opportunity for him to get a big win for early here in the season before Christmas. I remember Bo Jordan really hasn't been tested this year, so do you think Sebastian can push him? You know, Bo clearly is the favorite on paper. You know, Sebastian, if he's healthy, 100%, yeah, I think this is a better match than a lot of people will think, but I still see Jordan winning here. I do too. All right, top 10 battle between West Virginia's Jacob Smith and Virginia Tech's Jared Hott goes down Sunday afternoon. Tony, who are you taking here? These two are no strangers to each other. Multiple matches over multiple years, and just a couple weekends ago, Hott picked up Smith at the Cliff King Classic. Took him into overtime, won them out six to four. Smith always gives him the battle, so I'm going to pick with Howe because he got that win at Cliff Keen. All right, our next match features two seniors, two season vets, and Cornell's Brian Rilabutu and Oki State's Kyle Crutchmer. I mean, these two didn't even have a chance to get on the award stand last year, so you know they're just chomping at the bit to get to St. Louis. Yeah, Crutchmer and Rilabutu both need these early matches to test themselves because they, they haven't been tested. Rilabutu does have a loss to Zahid Valencia, but that's really been his toughest match. All right, sticking with the same duel, the matchup of the weekend comes between number one game. Gabe Dean of Cornell versus number four, Nolan Boyd of Oklahoma State. That one, of course, at 84. Big time rematch going down at Gallagher Ive Arena. Yeah, Boyd and Dean lit up the scoreboard last year with Boyd getting the best of him, topping in 14 to 9 and snapped Dean's 52 match win streak. So you know, Dean hasn't lost since that match. He's wanting to come back and get a little revenge. I mean, he got the revenge. He ended up winning the national title. So for me, that's all that matters. Yes, yes, and no. I mean, wrestlers, they don't forget a single match that they lost. Whether it's at Gallagher Arena, St. Louis, and their high school gym, he wants this one bad. He he thinks about this. I I guarantee you, he thinks about this at one point during his training. He wants this. He I see Dean winning big. We got to take a quick time out after the break. Wisconsin's head man Barry Davis joins the program. We'll talk a little bit about Las Vegas and what's ahead for the Badgers. You're watching DWN, powered by Nike Wrestling. The war raged for generations. No amount of bravery and conviction could end the infected, unyielding rage. And with every battle, the evil grew, changed, evolved. The warriors needed nothing short of a miracle to stop the infection, and a miracle they received. Your body is at war against skin infections and diseases each time you step onto the mat. Protect yourself against the invasion. Defend so, defend what you have built.
only one pizza joint that has your best interests in mind. They make every single pie from scratch. The freshest ingredients, 100% real mozzarella. Oh, and if your engine's running a quart low, well, they can take care of that too. Casey's, famous for pizza. Right now, get free breadsticks with the purchase of any large made from scratch pizza. Barry Davis's Wisconsin Badgers are ranked in the top 20 and off to a hot start, picking up three big dual victories over Indiana, Duke, and Northern Iowa. Here to talk about it in the Nike hot seat, Barry Davis. Barry, how's it going? Great, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Let's talk a little bit about your heavyweight. Connor Medbury took home the heavyweight title. And Medbury and Ty Walls, it seems to be the match that's going to happen over and over and over again. Right now, uh, Connor is doing an outstanding job. What's been the difference between uh, Connor as a, as a sophomore uh, all the way to this year? Because I think I've seen market improvement. Well, I, I think the Olympic race year last year helped him quite a bit. He spent some time with um, the Olympic team, went down to Rio with those guys, had a chance to um, you know, get bigger and stronger body-wise, uh, won a trip over, uh, tournament overseas. So all that you know, being around that type of experience and getting that type of experience there, the truty wise, um, it made a big difference in, in his wrestling career, but leadership both. So he's done a great job for us. I'm glad to have him back. It's made a big difference. It's made a big difference with this team, especially the young guys. Let's talk a little bit about some of the youth on your squad, Coach. Uh, we'll start, at least with the conversation, we'll start with uh, the, the, the Wick boys, the twins. Let's talk about those California kids. Uh, they're doing well. Um, we knew coming in, they were our number one um, recruits that year, um, and they chose Wisconsin, but I tell you, they love the sport of wrestling. But at the same time, though, too, in recruiting those two young men, we knew we were getting more than just wrestlers. Kids that are dedicated to the sport of wrestling, that love wrestling, but great character, great leadership, and um, you know, great personalities. So they've been a plus for our room. They're making everybody else step up. They've had success early. Uh, every time I, I walk in the our players' rounds over there, some guys are on their phone doing other things. Evan Wick always has his computer always, always looking at Russell all the time. So um, it tells you where their head's at and um, how, how great they want to be in this sport. Coach, the Midlands is a very special event for many of us, you included, uh, myself included. And I, I often wonder why. It means something, I'm sure, different to everybody, okay? means something different to everybody. Um, and I asked Tom Brands that question. I asked Tom Ryan that question. I've asked uh, people that have been there, not only as a coach, but competitors as well. What does the Midlands Championships mean to you? Uh, great history. If you go back, um, when it wasn't that very many opens at all, it wasn't Ben and John Peterson, Dan Gable, Lee Kemp's, you know, the Schultz's. So that was a great tournament. It still is a great tournament. So it's... Um, it's very prestigious, um, and I like the history of it, and it's a, it's a great tournament. But uh, I know this. We're not ready. That tournament will bite me in the butt because um, as a college athlete, I had more losses than Midlands tournament. I had nine losses in my career. I had five losses at Midlands. I never made it to the finals in college. Yep, so we're not ready. That tournament, it, it, it'll, it'll get you. So uh, it's a grind. You know, a two-day tournament. Um, again, ready to go. I think you got a lot of unattached guys there that, are, that have competed before, and they, under, they know what it's about. So you better take a moment at the time be ready to go. If you're not, you'll be in trouble. Barry Davis has been our guest today. You can keep up with the Badgers at uwbadgers.com. Appreciate the time, Barry. Appreciate it, Scott. Love you. Have a good day. I mean, it's early in the season, but the Badgers are really wrestling well. Do you think they can make some noise in the Big Ten? You know, Wisconsin had a great Cliff Keen invite. They, they, they had a lot of people on the podium. You know, few brass spots in this lineup. Connor Medbury, Isaac Jordan. Stickley has been wrestling really well at 133 pounds. He picked up a big win over Josh Albert of Northern Iowa here last weekend. You know, I think they have some, some individuals can, that can win those Big Ten titles. 
tournament race, not so much. Waiting in the wing, those Wick boys. I think we're going to see a lot more what the Badgers can do at the Midlands Championship coming up December 29th and 30th. And just as a reminder, we'll be bringing you live audio from every session at the Midlands live on our Facebook page, at Takedown Wrestling. Well, that's it for us. I'm Scott Casper. That's Tony Hager for Brad Johnson and the balance of us here at Global Wrestling News. Happy holidays to each and every one of you. Thank you.